Only at Harvard. <laughs> If we don't have any objections, even if we do, we're starting. We're glad to be here tonight. We thank you for joining us for our personal perspectives. It was only uh, last semester that I was sitting in the chair to the far right where Jim Edgar is, enjoying my first entree into the fellowship program of the Institute of Politics, of which I had had a couple friends say, you really shouldn't go up there. You being a Southern Republican shouldn't go up to that place up in Harvard and having uh, Use better judgment, I came up here and had one of the greatest experiences of my life. And I cannot tell you how thrilling it is to be a part of one of the greatest, if not the greatest, program I believe in the United States, where you can come and truly interchange and exchange ideas and understand the practical aspects of politics from what you may read in the newspaper to what you may see in academia to the truth of the real life experiences of these men to my right and the ladies to the left. See, segregation is still alive and well in Harvard. Yeah, but Michael, Michael, he's a, he's a boy. <laughs> Solidarity. <laughs> and, and I can already tell you, this is a great group, and they are going to bring great honor to the concept of this program, which was started in 1966, obviously in honor of one of the greatest men in American political history, President John F. Kennedy. This is a living memorial tribute uh, to a man who understood the importance of giving back to society. So having said all that, and you've been learning more about uh, these men and women, about their personal perspectives tonight, we will hear from, but their study groups and the opportunities for you to exchange with them and learn the nuances, the finesses, and as I heard, the true confessions, and believe me, you're not going to get true confessions from a consultant <laughs> under any circumstances. So he started out with a lie. <laughs> you pay enough. We <laughs> Ooh. Thank you for coming tonight. And I would like to first introduce, and we will, I will introduce, and after I introduce uh, each speaker, each fellow, uh, they will speak for five to seven minutes on why they got involved into this arena and their dreams and their aspirations and what motivated them and the fun of being here, of which they'll have more to say at the end of the semester. But let me introduce first a good friend of mine that I served with when I was governor, uh, Jim Edgar. And by the way, I was governor of South Carolina and uh, until January of 1999. And I served with Jim Edgar and got to know, I was a little old state in the South, you know, and these big governors from uh, the North <laughs> and got to know Jim Edgar and Jim Edgar while I must admit he married way over his head Brenda who's out here somewhere <laughs> just like myself married way over my head but Jim Edgar uh, has a tremendous political experience in Illinois of over 30 years of service from the House of Representatives and not to mention Secretary of State and the list goes on and on as he served as governor for two terms focusing on education, human services, while maintaining physical, dis physical discipline. And I got to work with Jim. If you recall, when Republicans took control of Congress, Republican governors and Democrat governors began working together to try to move the hill. When there were all these stalemates, as we all remember so vividly, Katie, <laughs> Jim Edgar did more in working and bringing the coalitions together, the left and the right, Republicans and Democrats together, on consensus, whether it was welfare reform or funding for highway infrastructure, and the list goes on in the impasse that we had in 1995. And I became a great fan of Jim Edgar's right then and there because of his commitment, his honor, his integrity. And when I was elected chairman of the Republican Governors Association in 1998, I think Jim said, oh my gosh, I've had enough, I'm not running again. When I see these young guys at that age coming into the ball game, but having said that, Jim, good to see you. Thank you, David. And up to the last comment, I was going to say, I'd vote for you for governor of South Carolina. Uh, let me just say it's my pleasure to be here at the Kennedy uh, School during this uh, semester. Uh, we've been asked to talk a little bit about 
how we got into politics, our background. Uh, David's already mentioned, I spent 30 years in state government. Uh, I just left the governor's office uh, in January of this year. Before being governor for eight years, I served as secretary of state in Illinois. Now, to most of you, that may not mean much, but anybody from Illinois, that's the important office. That's the guy that gives out the driver's license. Mm -hmm. And so I was the most important person to teenagers in the state of Illinois, <laughs> the secretary of state. Prior to that, I served uh, two terms as a member of the Illinois General Assembly. Before that, I served as a chief aide to the speaker and the Senate president in the Illinois legislature. So 30 years in state government uh, gave me a, uh, a great opportunity to see the democratic process work. Uh, I got into government early on. I was in second grade when I won my first election. Now, I'd like to tell you it was for noble <laughs> reasons. Uh, I got elected because my girlfriend was popular and she got elected and so they voted for me. <laughs> uh, I stayed in it. I liked that time because I remember the teacher that we were Red Cross representatives and they, she took us downtown to buy some things we were going to put in the Red Cross packages and she bought us both an ice cream cone. And I thought this politics isn't all bad. <laughs> now, later on, I continued to run for class office and always appreciated and enjoyed politics watching it. Uh, and I realized early on in the 1950s when I was growing up that uh, if you were going to make a difference, you needed to be involved in politics. That whether we liked it or not, government was here to stay and was going to affect all aspects of our lives. And we better have good people in government. And I wanted to be involved in making those decisions. And I was fortunate uh, throughout school, kids used to vote for me. I never thought they necessarily liked me, they just got used to voting for me. And when I was student party president at my <laughs> university, I was active in the Young Republican, but the Democratic County Chairman came to me and said you ought to apply for the legislative internship program. He wanted to get me off campus. And uh, <laughs> I got involved as a legislative intern, and that really gave me my start. And I would urge any of you who have an interest in government to, to get involved in government. Uh, school is great, but there's nothing better than practical experience. Whether you work in government, you get involved in the campaign. I did that early on, was fortunate to be able to move up the ladder from a staffer to a legislator to Secretary of State, then to Governor. And uh, I can't think of anything in society that you can have a greater impact on what's going on than to be in public service. So, is that my five minutes, or what are you raising your hand? No, I was, uh, I was gonna ask you, those of you, if our forum's interfering with your talking, I'd you know, let us know, but if y'all could hold it down in the back, we'd appreciate it. So please, uh, anybody up there talking, hold it down, please. Obviously, <laughs> kind of like the voters in South Carolina. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's somebody in the back that's talking really kind of loud. Would you kind of hold it down or carry your conversation out so we can continue with the forum? We don't want to interfere with your discussions up there. So, Jim, take it on. But again, I think if you really want to make a difference, being involved in public service is a place you can make a difference. Now, not always easy. Uh, I think everyone here who's been in elected office, we've had our ups and downs. Uh, you win some and you lose some. But if you really want to look back and say, you know, you had an impact, what you're involved in here at the Kennedy School, what hopefully you'll be involved in later in your life, you can make a difference. And what I want to talk about in my study group is the realities of governing. Uh, there's a lot of talk, and I think very interesting learning how you get elected and the politics. Sometimes I don't think there's enough emphasis on the politics once you are elected. And how do you govern? How do you make things happen? How do you compromise without giving up your principles? How do you move people who don't want to move in certain directions? How do you deal with the media, which isn't always a pleasant experience? How does a chief executive deal with the legislature or vice versa? Uh, those are problems that uh, I think you can only deal with by doing it. It's not something you can learn in a textbook. And uh, I would hope that uh, from our study group, you'll have an insight in some of the, the challenges you meet in elected office, but more importantly, maybe some of the ways to meet those challenges and try to move your agenda to try to get things done. Now, I would caution anyone who maybe is interested in reforms or 
issues. That's not what we're going to talk about in my session. We're going to talk about the practicalities of governing. And we're not going to tilt at windmills. We're going to talk about what you can get done and how you can get those things done. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll have some lively discussions and you'll have at least an observation from someone or one person's point of view of maybe how the governmental process works. Uh, I hope those of you who can make it uh, will be there. I look forward to having uh, some very uh, interesting talks with you in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Dan Lundgren from the country of California, <laughs> one of the world's largest economies running for governor of California isn't just an ordinary feat. And Dan Lundgren was elected to Congress at the early age of 30, 31 in that neighborhood and served, what, five terms, Dan? Five terms. And of course, as you well know, became Attorney General and served there with extraordinary distinction as he was elected uh, head of that organization for the Attorney Generals around the country, but more importantly than that, and I say this all candidates, when Dan was Attorney General, Democrats and Republicans alike loved and respected Dan Lundgren. He was a man who had, and does, still does, conservative principles, but espoused those conservative principles with great integrity and with intellect. And you all know he became the Republican nominee for our governor in what I think it was National Review Magazine said, the great right hope of America, <laughs> uh, only to see, of course, a defeat in an incredible campaign and an incredible state and those of you who have been keeping up with him while he's here, he's going to be doing a forum entitled Values, Vision, Victory, and Defeat, A Life in Politics. Now, Dan, my only question is, is that defeat referring to the election or is that referring to uh, the whimpering Irish football team this year? Oh, my God. Uh, I am a Notre Dame grad and we don't talk about that um, this year. You really had to hit me where it hurts. Uh, it's a religion in our household. My dad went there, my brothers went there, my son went there, my sisters went to St. Mary's at Notre Dame, so it really hurts. Thanks a lot. Um, I first got involved in politics when I was very young. My parents were both activists at the local level. Never got paid for what they did. They always did it on a volunteer basis, and I sort of came into the process by osmosis. I, I thought I was going to be a doctor like my dad, and then God sent me a very direct message. It was called organic chemistry. Um, <laughs> and he sent it with an exclamation point, as a matter of fact. So I had to look for something else to do. And eventually, I wandered into politics. When I was in, um, when I was in uh, either my last year of high school or, or first uh, year or so of college, I saw a play called Man for All Seasons. It was the most affecting play I've ever seen in my life. It probably had an impact on me that I little realized at that time. And uh, actually, we're going to take excerpts of that from the first, uh, in our first um, session because it really um, goes to the question of whether you can have values and be in politics. And, and what's, where's the proper domain? And today, we have the whole question, and this was brought up when Billy Graham was here, can you bring religious values into uh, public policy? Uh, we're going to examine that in our uh, seminar. Uh, one of the great uh, works of of literature in the last uh, 50 years is Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham City Jail. He wrote it uh, while he was in solitary confinement when he had no resource uh, books. He did it from memory. And uh, if you really believe that he believed in what he was doing, you have to then ask whether what he was saying was relevant only to that time or is it relevant for all time? Because he made an appeal for the Civil Rights Revolution based on our religious beliefs. And if you don't believe that, to read a letter from the Birmingham City Jail. We would not have had a civil rights revolution in this country had it not been for the active participation of the clergy and religiously based people. And the question is today, it seems to me, whether that can be done again. Or is it only politically correct when it's done on one side, not the other? I mean, those are the kinds of things I, I'd like to talk about. I first ran for Congress when I was 29 years of age. My wife was my campaign manager. We had two children under two. She was pregnant with our third child. We put an extra phone in the house and we put a different ring on it so that we'd know that that's what it was. Three months left to go in the campaign. She told me uh, I had to move the campaign out of the house. Uh, I won the primary. My daughter was born three days after the primary. That's how I remember her birthday. Um, I ran against an incumbent, lost by 2,866 votes out of 200,000. Never give it a thought. 
um, since that time. <laughs> Ran two years later and beat the incumbent uh, by a 10-point margin. When I first met with uh, my pollster in my first campaign as Dick Worthlin, one of the noted pollsters in America, was not noted then because he was helping me directly, uh, I said, I need to know what those figures are. And he said, well, let me come down and talk to you about them. I said, I need them so I can talk to my supporters so they can give me money. He said, let me tell you about it personally. I said, why can't you give them to me over the phone? He says, well, they need some interpretation. <laughs> this was in um, early September before the uh, November election. And he said, well, the good news is that uh, the incumbent has less than 55%, which shows he's vulnerable. He's got 51. <laughs> he's got nowhere to go but down. And I said, well, what do I have? He said, well, you have 16%. You have nowhere to go but up. Um, I ended up with 49.3% of the vote. I served five terms in the Congress, came in with the uh, revolutionary group of Newt Gingrich and uh, Dick Cheney and uh, Carol Campbell. Um, Geraldine Ferraro was in our class, some guy named uh, Phil Graham, I don't know what happened, he was a Democrat uh, at that time. Uh, quite a different group. Uh, went back home, ran for Attorney General, was elected there twice and then ran for governor. Raised $32 million over two and a half years for the race for governor. Uh, we're going to also examine uh, the question of uh, finances and the proposals for finance. My position is that uh, the current financial campaign finance system doesn't corrupt you, it exhausts you and too little um, thought is given to that. I think that's important. My also, my belief is that money is always going to be there. The question is what channels is it going to go in? We're going to examine the various channels it can go in. We're always going to have a fellow named David Horowitz, who was uh, a 60s radical, uh, worked very closely with the Black Panthers, um, converted to uh, conservatism, and we're going to examine the question of um, political correctness and where we are today. So I'm uh, looking forward to this. I had the reporter from the Crimson ask me the other day uh, what I was looking for in this. I said to um, re-energize myself and invigorate the students. So if you're interested in that process, join us on Wednesday afternoons from 4 to 5.30. Uh, I'm going to enjoy it. I hope you will. Talking about finances, uh, Dan, uh, we know where all that money goes. It goes to these political consultants <laughs> that we have to, you know, it's so sad because we go out there and beat the bushes. And I can remember in 1998 when I was chairman of the RGA and I was talking to Pete Wilson about Pete, you know, how much money we're going to need out there in California. And, and Pete said a lot of it. And we started sitting down and analyzing, well, how are we going to raise all that kind of money? How much are we going to raise in California? And how much are we going to raise uh, on the East Coast? And we, everybody really teamed up well. It's great. Uh, camaraderie and a lot of uh, team spirit to try to win California and a lot of money and, and it aggravates candidates when you're out there raising all that money and you see all that money just you know going into the TV going to the radio going to these consultants who tell you don't mean what you say and don't say what you mean and Ray <laughs> I cry foul already <laughs> this uh, this man has forgotten more politics than I will ever know. And he's been in this business uh, since I was a teeny little kid. And he learned it, <laughs> which wasn't that long ago. Hey, old boy. But he learned it from the best of the best in Louisiana-style politics. And believe you me, <laughs> if you learn Louisiana-style politics, you can dogfight any political fight there is in the country. And Ray, how many campaigns? 300 or more? 300. Presidential, vice presidential, gubernatorial, senatorial, congressional, the whole nine yards. He's been there, he's done it. And his forum study session is True Confessions of a Political Consultant. Now, y'all know that ain't going to happen. That just ain't going to happen. But I can guarantee, as we say, I can guarantee slap that gum to you. Y'all go have a good time in that forum learning about the good and the bad, the ugly of politics, consultants and how they interact, and doing the polling and doing all the techniques and pulling all the tricks. I know he won't tell you all of them, but Ray, it's good to have you here. Well, thank you. <laughs> Makes me, he said, true confessions. He doesn't think I'll tell the truth. I had a, a cat at one time. I asked him if he was, wasn't for good government. He said, well, he said, uh, I'm for pretty good government. Uh, <laughs> My father was a labor organizer. Talk about how we got into this. I'm a liberal, incidentally. Uh, that word they've turned into a, something dirty. But uh, my father was a labor organizer in South Texas. 
And I remember my first political conflict, because all we talked about in our house was the plight of the working man. I learned to read from picket signs and the, and the CIO newspaper before they're affiliated with AFL-CIO. And my first political conflict was I had to march at eight years of age back to the school, Lee, Lee School Elementary, and explain to my teacher that she was wrong in her history course, that George Washington was not the father of our country. He was an aristocrat who owned slaves <laughs> and earned his living on the backs of working people, and Franklin Roosevelt was the father of America. <laughs> and if it wouldn't have been for Franklin Roosevelt, we'd be communistic now because he saved us from communism. In our house, my mother was a religious fundamentalist, still is. We couldn't use curse words, but you could always say damned Republican. <laughs> <laughs> and you could always say damned Herbert Hoover, the man who systematically set out to destroy this country so the rich could subjugate the working man and drive their Cadillacs and Packards <laughs> over roads built of the crushed bones of working people. <laughs> but we weren't extreme. <laughs> so when I, uh, <laughs> so after I, after I was graduated from college, I went to work for the Associated Press. I can see I should have hired you right early. <laughs> uh, objective member of the press. <laughs> I was very objective. And didn't like that because they made you be objective. Uh, they would always make you go get the other side. I just thought that was silly. So sooner or later, I was a speechwriter for a new governor of Louisiana. And uh, he couldn't pass anything because he had some old dinosaur legislators. So he moved me away from the captain of the little office. And he said, I'll raise the money. We've got to find some people to beat these guys. So we passed some reform legislation. And that's how I got in the business. And my first candidate was a woman. My second candidate was an African-American. My first candidate was a Roman for treasure. And uh, she had been the girlfriend of Earl Long and had driven him when he escaped the mental institution <laughs> to Mexico. And uh, the governor felt like he owed her, so he was going to support her for treasure. And he said, now you've got to do the campaign. Well, I was honored to do the campaign. <laughs> so uh, we didn't have to. This was 1967. I'd just come out of, my, out of graduate school. We didn't have our roles to find then. What was a political consultant? I don't know. You know, I'm still wondering about that, what we do, because it keeps changing, changing, changing. So I drove this lady around. I wrote her speeches. I made her television commercials in black and white, incidentally. Uh, made her television commercials. Uh, did just about made her hotel reservations. Anything I could do to make her life easier and help her campaign because we're in that transition between a media campaign and an organizational campaign. So one day I'm asleep in the car, after a hard night of driving, I'm sure. Uh, but I'm asleep in the car, and she's with a bunch of ladies on the veranda of this plantation home in Vidalia, Louisiana. And all the ladies wore white gloves, short little white gloves made out of cotton. And they drank sherry, prodigious amounts of sherry. And they were drinking sherry, and all of a sudden I was sort of dozing, and someone grabbed me by the shoulder, and it was a sheriff named Cat Duce. <laughs> Cat Duce wore two guns strapped to his legs, like Matt Dillon with cross scabbards, big hat. And he said, son, he says, are you the man who drives Miss Mary Evelyn around? I said, well, I wanted to explain, no, I, I'm a political consultant. But I looked, I said, yes, sir. Uh, he said, well, how do you protect her? I said, I, I, I don't protect her, sheriff. He says, what if something happens? I said, well, nothing happens. He says, you got a gun? I said, no. He said, T-boy, talk to his deputy, go get that 38 out of the squad car. <laughs> so he got the pistol, and he said, can you shoot it? Well, of course I can shoot him. I'm a southern male. Of course I can shoot him. Half deaf in my right ear from shooting shotguns, of course. So he loaded the pistol, and he pointed to a stump, and he said, can you hit that stump? I said, sure. Bang, I hit the stump. Do it again. I hit it again. By this time, the ladies were coming out of the, on the veranda to watch me shoot, and they would applaud when I'd hit the stump. And so I, I shot, the, shot the cylinder out of shells, and he said, well, that's pretty good. He said, now, stick this in your belt. I said, now, Sheriff, I'm not carrying that pistol in my belt. He said, well, put it under the seat there. And I guess probably when they tore, took that, that Buick off the wrecking yard, the pistol was probably still under the seat. I never really saw it again. Never had to protect Miss Mary Evelyn. I think people would have been protected from her. <laughs> uh, she won. 
and she won handily, and she was elected treasurer, and, and uh, she uh, served until a woman named Mary Landrew ran, and I did her campaign many, many years later, and Mary Landrew became treasurer, then Mary Landrew, I did her campaign to become United States Senator, and I'd represented her father for mayor of, of New Orleans, so now I'm doing generations of families. <laughs> So what my class is going to be about is how to carry a gun and protect women candidates. <laughs> but it's going to be about the changes that have, that have taken place since uh, we got into high-tech campaigns and specialization, where now we have people who specialize in very minute things, polling, direct mail, uh, design, uh, campaign management, et cetera. And I'm going to talk about how we do it and what we do on a daily basis. And I'm going to try to relate those things through stories that explain this transition and this process. Uh, there used to, we used to make a lot of money at this because there weren't many of us, but now we don't make much money at all. And, so, uh, and it's a, incidentally, it's not the Democrat Party, it's the Democratic Party. And, uh, or I'm going to start calling you guys Republics. <laughs> but, I hope you will come sit in the class. I think we'll have some fun. We're going to do some video, some technical stuff. I'm going to have a technical session. We're going to have some interesting speakers. Uh, but mostly we're going to laugh, tell a few stories, and talk about what really happens in a campaign. So, What was the, uh, was the governor, Edwards, that got uh, indicted? Remember that line? Talk about traditional, fantastic southern lines when they got him with women and yeah. money. What was that line? Tell them that line. What he said was, yeah, I represent him. What he said was, <laughs> they... Uh, they accused him of, uh, of something, gambling. He said, yeah, yeah, I love to gamble. And they didn't know what to say. He said, yeah, I, ga I gamble all the time. He said, well, Governor, don't you think that would beat you? That will beat you? He said, look, I won't be beaten unless I'm caught in bed with a dead girl or a live boy. <laughs> Is that the one you mean? No, that wasn't the one I mean, but I remember that one. <laughs> That's the one I remember. Well, the one I remember was these, they asked him, well, Governor, you know, you got caught, you had women, you had money, and you had booze, and he, he said, anytime you take women and booze and money and put it in front of old Governor Evans, you go get me every time. <laughs> you remember that? I've heard that story. I don't, I don't know that if that was like, no, I, didn't write, I didn't write that. We probably rewrote that one for you. But <laughs> <laughs> Next on our list. <laughs> How you got to follow that? <laughs> A man who should be able to follow anything because he's been writing the greatest speeches I've known in America. And if you recall the last four State of the Union addresses, you remember how they went on and on and on. <laughs> and you're thinking, God, I've got to go to the bathroom so bad. Blame this guy right here because he wrote those speeches. And Jim, we talked about this. I really believe that, and you don't have to confess this. <laughs> But those State of the Union addresses had such great content, and governors like this. These are great speeches because I think they took all the State of the State addresses and got all the great ideas and used them in the State of the Union addresses. And they're great stuff. <laughs> but all joking aside, I don't think anyone would doubt that some of the greatest speeches we've seen in a long time have come in these last few years, with Reagan with his style and George Bush with his style, but uh, President Bill Clinton, regardless of what we may think about President Clinton from a Republican, Democrat, or whatever, putting all that aside, have delivered some tremendous speeches. And Michael Waldman has written over, what, a couple thousand speeches? Edited or wrote nearly 2,000. Edited or wrote oh, nearly 2,000 speeches for State of the Union, two inaugural, and the acceptance speech uh, for the presidential convention in 1996. And the list goes on. Uh, his topic is going to be the bully pulpit, behind the bully pulpit. And I think that'll be one of the, the most interesting opportunities for you to find out what really goes on in speech writing. Because believe you me, as all of us that have been in elected position and delivering those speeches and the background preparation that takes place and the little words you have to just twist and move around because if you say it this way, this group gets mad. You say it that way, you get this many people messed up in the poll. And, or Senator so-and-so has got to have this word in there because the big vote's coming up tomorrow. And all these little nuances that you wonder, why was that in the speech? Payback or whatever the case may be. And so, Michael, uh, I've enjoyed getting to know you just in the past couple of months from 
working with children in school and this, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, Michael Walton is going to be a great tribute uh, to the fellowship program and so Michael glad to hear from you well thank you I, as you can see with all the folks up here uh, I'm going to learn a lot about speeches from just uh, hanging out with these people <laughs> um, first of all what makes you think I can talk for only five minutes <laughs> the speeches got that length somehow. We didn't. We did take all the state of the state speeches. We we didn't take the best ideas. We just stapled them together and <laughs> delivered them at once. Um, That's what I thought. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, and a, a thrill for me to be able to be a fellow here at the Institute of Politics. Um, uh, quite a few of my predecessors, who have been presidential speechwriters, have done this as their decompression chamber. Uh, upon leaving government, whether it's uh, Carter's speechwriters, Nixon's, uh, Reagan's, uh, it's an ideal place to uh, sort through what, what I've been through, uh, try and understand what I've seen and done, uh, and learn from all of you. Um, I, I got into this work. Um, at one level, I was born to it. My parents, and so, uh, so, uh, I think this, the reaction to this will be generational. My parents met at an Americans for Democratic Action cocktail party for Adlai Stevenson. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm to the manner born. Um, uh, and uh, I, uh, I was a, in college, I was a journalist. I was on the school paper. Uh, and I had the very fortunate experience uh, that I hope some of you have of having a job right out of college that was more idealistic than anything I'd had before. It was 1982, it was a time uh, when Reagan was ascendant, when uh, Dan and all his friends were uh, doing so well on Capitol Hill. And I wanted to be engaged and involved, and I wound up working for a uh, liberal think tank, and I wanted to become, and I became a public interest lawyer. Um, so often, uh, my sense in, in talking to people is that they see idealism and, and their political beliefs as kind of an affectation they had in college. And then when they, they collide with the reality uh, upon leaving, it's seen as something they leave behind. And, and I just think I was very lucky that for whatever reason, I had a job where I could write books and uh, be engaged and do things that pushed it even more in the other direction. Um, I ran a consumer group. Uh, I was busy throwing bricks at government. Uh, and at the White House, um, I was uh, it, then, to my great surprise, in 1992, discovered myself on the other side catching the bricks and ducking uh, as best I could. Um, I was, before I was a speechwriter, I dabbled in it, I enjoyed it. Uh, I was actually a policy person. Um, uh, I was in charge, uh, and don't laugh, I was in charge of campaign finance reform for the <laughs> White House. Uh, for several years, and I thought, among other things, I needed something else on my resume before I left government. Um, we worked very hard to try and pass uh, what we believed was good campaign finance reform, and I worked on a whole bunch of other things. And then in 1995, I became director of speech writing for the president, uh, and I did serve in that job until last month. Um, it was an incredible opportunity to see a lot of things uh, and to experience firsthand a lot of the changes in the presidency and in the way the country is governed. First of all, it, I've talked to uh, a lot of the people who did what I did before I did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Reagan, one of Reagan's speechwriters said to me that he thought that the change in the media and other environment that the president, this president has, exists in is as different from Clinton to Reagan mm -hmm. as from Reagan to Coolidge. Let me give you a couple of examples. Clinton, in a non-election year, not when he's running for re-election, spoke in public 550 times. Reagan, similar year, spoke in public 320 times. Harry Truman, similar, not running for re-election year, spoke in public 88 times. So you can see it's going up like that. It's not just that Clinton likes to talk, though he does. <laughs> it's not just that he's good at it, though he is. But the bully pulpit, the ability of a president as the only national figure to speak, is an increasingly central part of what a president does. And now, any time he walks out into the Rose Garden, at some level, it's the equivalent of a nationally televised address. There are five all news networks broadcasting it. On the other hand, he actually can't easily get an Oval Office address. 
When Nixon resigned, his opening line in the speech was, this is the 39th time I've spoken to you from this office. Well, I, w I, I haven't totaled it up, but I bet Clinton hasn't given an Oval Office address more than 10 or 12 times. And that's because the networks literally won't give the president the time. They want to know, unless there's a war or a scandal. Uh, it, they, it's not interesting enough. Uh, so we are constant. One thing that I saw and was part of, and I have the tendonitis in my typing hands to prove it, mm -hmm. is this incredible velocity of speeches, speeches, speeches that this president and any president, I think, has to do. Uh, another thing that, that I had a chance to see and that the study group will talk about and look at is that presidential speeches are not just pretty rhetoric. Though you hope it, it's pretty rhetoric. And it's not just supposed to move the immediate audience, but it's a state document. It's where policy and politics all come together. Uh, and most of the folks who I'm going to be bringing in as guests are not speechwriters, but policy people, because that's who I worked with. Uh, that's where the real tussles and the fights were. Um, when uh, one good example of the way a presidential speech can change policy and move things is the 1998 State of the Union. Uh, remember when he said, save Social Security first. Now at that point, it looked like there was an unstoppable, there was a sudden surplus, nobody was expecting it. Uh, and it looked unstoppable that, that the Congress would want to uh, pass a big tax cut and that uh, basically we weren't sure if the Democrats would hold firm against it. And it looked like that was what was going to happen. We had a long and very secret process of trying to figure out what our proposal was. We had two drafts of the speech, the real one and the, the fake one, and only a few people saw the real one. And when he walked out there in the middle of that, um, in the middle of that intense time, if you remember, that was just a few days after the Lewinsky scandal broke. Uh, and he said, we have a surplus. What are we going to do with it? I have a simple four-word answer. Save Social Security first. Well, the Democrats all stood up and applauded, because they applauded everything he said. And uh, Gingrich sort of looked around. And then he stood up and applauded. And all the Republicans looked at each other and looked at him. And they stood up and applauded. <laughs> And at that moment, because of that one sentence that Clinton said, a trillion dollars shifted in the budget from tax cut to Social Security. And there's no better, and that's basically where it's stayed ever since. Now they're all competing over who, who's saving Social Security best. Uh, that kind of impact is very uh, real and tangible, and we'll talk about that. And then I'll just talk a bit, and some of my guests will talk a bit about the, just the sheer craziness of it all. Uh, you can't imagine. Um, uh, all the chefs, everybody wanting to help out. I, I always said we would install a round keyboard so everyone could type at once on the State of the Unions. Um, the, uh, you know, the last minute changes in topic or position, uh, two, I'll give you two examples of what it was like. Uh, just in that 98th State of the Union, uh, we had at the end of it a tribute to Senator John Glenn. And we were very proud of ourselves. We had actually finished the text early enough that we were going to release it to the press. But we thought we, would, we wanted to save the tribute to John Glenn so it would be a surprise to Glenn and, and other things like that. So we prepared the speech to be released. And we just put some asterisks in and said, ending to come. We handed the disc to the press office people. And they were running off. And then someone <laughs> said, this was, remember, four days after the Lewinsky story broke. If we release a speech text, that says, ending to come, the stock market will crash. <laughs> the networks will preempt all their broadcasting. <laughs> Everyone will be waiting to see what is it he's saying. And when he gets to the tribute to John Glenn for going back into outer space, people will throw rocks at us. <laughs> 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 and so we pulled it back and just uh, took the asterisks out and uh, never, never worried about it. Uh, and there is a. a uh, was a joy in watching how Clinton worked. He has a great gift for this stuff. It's both intuitive and art. He has an understanding of the texts of American history and policy, but obviously also, in some ways, he's at his best when he's at the podium. And he's, he's just catching what an audience is thinking and, and reacting to it. Uh, but it could be kind of hairy for those of us who had to be the speechwriters. Or as he once, uh, he, he, we had a great relationship with him, but he, 
it, it's not always easy to admit that you have a speechwriter. After one of these State of the Unions, <laughs> he introduced me to Reverend Schuler, who'd been sitting in the box with the first lady. He said, this is Michael. And I swelled up with pride. He, he typed the speech. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly the scariest uh, one of these speeches was the, night, it was the 96 convention speech. We were on the train. We thought, this will be great. He'll, he'll, he'll be stuck on the train. He'll focus on the speech. They told us, you'll have your own office. They showed us a blueprint, the speech writing office. It was on Harry Truman's car. When we got there, the speech writing office was Harry Truman's bathroom. <laughs> and uh, we, it was good for concentration, but uh, it wasn't all that useful. And we sat and waited for him to come talk to us about the speech. And they said, oh, he's working on it. He's working on it. Except there was a loudspeaker. And unbeknownst to them, he was in the front of the train saying hello to the passers-by. And it was being pumped into the room as they were assuring us that he was working on it. Um, we fell to arguing among ourselves over who wrote what line. Uh, and instead of asking, arguing about who wrote Ask Not What You Can Do For Your Country, we were arguing about who thought that he should read the little engine that could to third graders at a stop, because <laughs> that was sort of what we were dealing with. And in the middle of this, he materialized. And uh, you know, he can sense these things through uh, osmosis or something. And he sa someone said, Mr. President, here's a new ending to the speech, and we think you'll really like it. And he said, ah, done. Don wrote this, was the name of the person who handed it to him. Michael, which section, he must have written it. Which section did you write? This is from Isaiah. God wrote that one. That's my favorite. And he left. That was our meeting with him. Finally, the day of the speech, he <laughs> knew what he wanted to say. He'd been thinking the whole time. And he rewrote it and wrote it and wrote it from scratch. And uh, that was the bridge to the 21st century. And we were finishing it up in the car on the way to the convention. I had a laptop. And apparently, the glow of the laptop was visible for, to the chase helicopters from the networks uh, <laughs> that were following us. And Peter Jennings said, as he saw the laptop glowing uh, with the president continuing to work, he said, let this be a lesson to the young people. Don't save your work to the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll teach some of these lessons. Uh, we'll tell some more stories. You'll get a chance to meet some of the folks who are still doing it. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and I appreciate it. Well, Michael, I think uh, it'll be fun, too, to hear some of the more mm -hmm. practical side is when you're getting all this preparation for the State of the State or State of the Union and, and the governor or the president's <clears throat> going through the delivery and preparation and practice, and then you get up there, and everything's to the T. All the technicians and everybody's been working so hard, and the teleprompter goes out. Every time. Every <laughs> time. And a lot of times, you never know, and you will see how effective and how truly a miracle worker or a governor or president can be when the teleprompter goes out. And that's what you've been working off of. It's a frightening thing. And you had that happen. Didn't you have that happen in well, we, uh, one of the early State of the Union addresses? In, uh, in the 1993 health care speech, uh, which I uh, fortunately didn't work on, uh, the, uh, the, the speech Union. on the teleprompter was the State of the Union from six months before. But that's just the one people know about. Some of them. <laughs> The president didn't even know about. The 1997 State of the Union, we had it all done. We'd rehearsed and rehearsed. And in the van on the way to the Capitol, I made a change on the disk, one comma, uh, on my laptop. And when we put it in the teleprompter, uh, he's at the front end of the House chamber. He's waving and shaking everybody's hand. We put it in the teleprompter, and it was one long paragraph. And these crew cut military guys who look like fighter pilots <laughs> or the teleprompter operators, and they're scrolling down, and we're going, there, there's a paragraph, there's a paragraph, there's a paragraph, and Clinton was walking down, waving, and we put, you know, 200 paragraph returns in in the two minutes before he got up there. And I don't think he knows that ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really hope he can show you the practical consequence of what really happens there, because if you deliver a speech, and all of a sudden you see it's totally dramatically different, the words are the same, but it's totally in a different context, it, it dynamically changes everything. And that's the practical side of the real life of personal perspectives in life and politics. Katie Wellen, talk about somebody I don't like. <laughs> I'm here because of her. <laughs> and so was Dan. I mean, I was a great popular governor. You know, who would ever thought that I would get defeated? Like, uh, I mean, a man in the South who tried to take down the flag and, you know, no respect. <laughs> Katie has been in politics for a long time. And uh, six years as, as the executive director. 
Seven, uh, seven years, mm -hmm. as well as in the finance side. So Katie's seen it all, been involved in national campaigns and been around for quite some time in the political arena. And she has seen how the pendulum has swung. Mm -hmm. When the Democrats controlled, as Jim remembers back in the 80s and 90s, the Democrats vastly controlled uh, most governors of state uh, positions, seats all across this country, to when the Republicans had the great momentum uh, in 1994, the revolution where we ended up with 32 Republican governors, mm -hmm. 30, 31, 32, uh, and it's seen it happen. But she understands the importance of vision and commitment, planning and strategy. And I think her session, her forum, her um, study group that's entitled From the State House to the White House Issues for the Year 2000 and Beyond will showcase how Katie is committed to the agenda of taking the Democrat principles and moving them forward, not living Democrat. Deke. <laughs> and how mm -hmm. the Republican Party and the Democrat Party are going to continue to fight these. Uh, there's no use of changing that. But Katie, we're glad to, to have you, and I don't think there's any question. Your personal perspective is something everyone will enjoy. Well, thank you, Governor Beasley. It's nice to be here with you, although I would. I know you would prefer to be in the Capitol, but maybe sometime. I'm enjoying and, this project. Right? I know, it's great. Give me a favor. Well, it was, it was, it, I could just say for maybe, it was an awful day in uh, November 4th or 5th, 1994, and we woke up the day after the election and we had 17 Democratic governors. That was not fun. <laughs> And uh, I said, oh, no, it's my fault. It's my fault. I've done the whole thing. But then I think it was big government and health care reform, and I, that was not my idea. So I felt a little <laughs> bit safe. Anyway, um, I want to thank you all. It's very nice to be here. Um, very uh, honored and pleased to be a fellow. And I want to thank these students who went through the selection process. Um, I uh, am in politics because of my mother, and like other fellows here today, because of their parents. My mother, um, who's actually here tonight, just dropped by. She worked for Congressman John F. Kennedy when he was a congressman, and Senator John F. Kennedy, and President John F. Kennedy, um, and uh, flew around the country organizing, organizing, organizing. And as the oldest of seven children, I guess I um, inherited that organizational um, talent. So my first job out of college was to go to Des Moines, Iowa, and organize uh, what used to be teas in the old Kennedy campaigns, but um, turned into be coffees because then we would invite men and women to them, not just women. And um, I organized at 22 years old um, the disastrous coffees, <laughs> the disastrous uh, caucuses for Senator Kennedy uh, in Iowa with a big team, but I was in charge of all the organization in the counties. And since then, um, it was very excited. I was very committed. I said, well, I'm just going to work hard and get somebody in the White House. Well, it took a long time from 1980 <laughs> to 1992. <laughs> and finally, um, we were successful in uh, electing President Bill Clinton um, to the presidency um, and had a very interesting um, uh, situation with the Democratic Governors Association that the Republicans um, uh, were very good in the, in the Republican National Committee and the Bush campaign at attacking President Clinton, then Governor Clinton, as a, uh, a southern governor from a small state. And a uh, southern governor from a small state, and that's all you heard every day, every day, every day. And since we did not have the apparatus and the infrastructure that the Republicans had built over the time that President Reagan had been president for two terms and then President Bush, that's 12 years. It's a wonderful infrastructure that you can build for communications and things like that at your national party committee and the campaigns or whatever. Our d small Democratic Governors Association with four staff people became um, an adjunct to the Little Rock Response War Room team. So anytime a governor or uh, anybody attacked the, the southern governor from a, a small state, uh, we were a Republican governor, and we were called, and we did the response that was sent out, and we responded within uh, 30 minutes to um, everything that was said about the southern governor from a small state. So, plus we organized all the governors into the campaign, but I'll go into that later. But it's been um, a terrific, uh, a terrific experience to finally get the White House back, be on the other side of the aisle from um, throwing rocks at the White House. We can't do that anymore, so we throw them up at the Senate and the in the House, and hopefully we'll get the House back. Um, but um, I've enjoyed uh, 
seven years as the executive director of the Democratic Governors Association. It has been a very um, fulfilling job uh, working with all of the Democratic governors um, when we had 32 and when we had 17, but I will tell you that I held it at 17. We never went below, so I was very happy about that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think we're going to go up. Um, and it's all cyclical. Anyway, um, but uh, <laughs> it was, it's been exciting to work on the issues such as welfare reform, health care, um, work in a consensus building way, work in a uh, partisan way with the House, the Senate, and the White House with Republican governors when we had to, against them when we had to, um, and um, it's, ju it was, it's just been, uh, it was a, a great time for me. Um, my course is going to be following all of the issues and agendas that are up for uh, in the year 2000 from um, the state legislatures to the governor's races to the Congress to the uh, governorships and to the, to the White House. We're going to have uh, the National Party Chairman Governor Roy Romer come and do a debate with the students in our class. We're going to have some very interesting folks come in and talk about the critical path to victory. Um, we're going to talk about the changing demo demographics in the voter population uh, and um, hopefully have some very good and, and honest um, discussion. So I just again want to say that I'm thrilled to be here and I'm very honored to be here with Governor Edgar and Governor Beasley and almost Governor Lundgren. <laughs> and I must say, I used to live in California. I'm, I, I worked a long time to try to get a Democratic governor in California too, so I'm sorry it had to happen at this time. <laughs> but I'm thrilled to be here and thank you very much. <laughs> Back in the last, the last few years, uh, when it seemed like Congress was always at a stalemate. They were always at each other's throat. And the truth be known, it, it is amazing how many times when I'd be meeting with the Republican governors in Clinton Key and before mm. Clinton, I say, call Katie, we've got to get a couple of Democratic mm. governors in. We need to sit down and see if we can't bring mm. uh, a few of the key ones on the Democrat and Republican side. And I believe we probably did more good in yes. absolving uh, resolving stalemates yeah. than uh, anything I've seen in a long, it, long time. It, it was interesting because during the whole um, welfare debate, um, the Democratic go there were Democratic governors and Republican governors would meet at the Hyatt or something. Then the Democratic governors would go to the White House and meet with Leon Panetta. The Republican governors would go to the Hill. Then they'd all meet. Then they come back again. This would go. This went on for three months, all night long. But it was. But they did a wonderful job. And the my colleague Clinton Key and uh, at the Republican Governors Association yeah. and your leadership was was terrific. And we did work well together. Yeah. How many times were the hands thrown up? Say, and the Hill would say, "Look, we we're through. If the governors are working out, we'll just take whatever they give." That's <laughs> happened a lot of times. Our last speaker tonight on personal perspectives is Claudia Winkler. And Claudia has become famous uh, in her own right, but particularly in the last few days when Pat Buchanan uh, on the Today Show called the Weekly Standard that dinky little magazine, which I know had to make Claudia <laughs> proud because as you well know, the Weekly Standard magazine, uh, Claudia uh, was the managing editor and is still is the managing editor and has a history, a lifelong history and experience in journalism. And I guess you started at the beat, uh, really the old fashioned way and working your way through for years and years and years. Well, and actually you're going to hear it was a pretty circuitous route. I've never been a reporter. I've never been on the, the news side of journalism. And uh, it, it, it's been anything but a straight path to, work my way into political journalism. Um, in, in reflecting on how I got here in preparation for tonight, it, it dawns on me that it probably all began when my father sat me and my sisters down when I was nine and read us the U.S. Constitution. He was from a little town in West Texas and somewhere de developed a tremendous love for this country and his his seriousness and reverence uh, for the Constitution made a great impression on me. And I think that's um, it's probably the original seed. But around the same time, I had, I guess, uh, another early political experience. My father had just entered the Foreign Service, and we just moved to New Zealand in 1957. And I saw my first political graffito, and it said, Yankee, go home. And uh, we lived in New Zealand for three years, then back in the States for two, then we moved to France. And all of the 
coming back and forth to this country and entering other cultures uh, was very stimulating in, in terms of um, forcing one to reflect on one's own country. I lived in France from 62 to 66 and went to a French high school where at a very anti-American time and uh, certainly got a different view from my father's as to where the center of world civilization lay. Um, from there, I went to college in this area at Tufts and uh, went to graduate school at Berkeley in medieval history. So you can see we're still pretty far from political journalism. Um, two weeks after I, had, after I took my master's exam, I had a baby. And two years after that, I had another. And a year after that, I found myself with two children to support. And being a verbal type with an interest in my country and others and so on, I found myself doing freelance editing in my hometown, Washington, DC. And uh, pretty soon, I became a staff editor at the American Enterprise Institute. Well, this was still in the 70s when liberalism was ascendant. And I myself had just finished voting for Jimmy Carter. And uh, at the time, people in Washington had either never heard of the American Enterprise Institute or they would say, oh, that fascist organization. Uh, well, I got a wonderful political education there. I got it both through my editing. Uh, I worked on a wide variety of books about public policy and government, and then in particular, a series of about 20 studies of elections around the world, democratic elections around the world. And meanwhile, it was a bit like a, a bit like a university without students. A bit like being a fellow at the IOP, because there was a steady stream of interesting guests that you could hear talk in a in a small group. And uh, whatever people thought about AEI, there was in fact a wide range of types of people, from Jesse Jackson to Vladimir Bukovsky, who came and talked to us there. And between what I was learning in my editing and working with all these political scientists and what I was learning from uh, these speakers and people I knew at AEI uh, and observing American politics, things started coming together. The, the election of 1980 was an important one because people I knew at AEI were working in all three campaigns. And for the first time, I started knowing more about events than I was learning from the newspaper. And I started to see how inadequate the newspaper coverage was, an experience we've all had. Uh, and so this sort of primed me so that when an opportunity arose for me to become an editorial writer, really out of the blue, through someone I knew, I had the nerve to try and moved to Buffalo, New York, where I became an editorial writer at the, the Buffalo Courier Express wrote my first editorial my first day on the job. And it was a little terrifying and uh, a real sink or swim experience and maybe a little um, shocking when you think of someone being in the position of writing editorials in the newspaper with so little direct experience of politics. But that's one of the realities of journalism that you're going to find out about in my group, how, uh, especially in the daily press, we're constantly being thrown into new situations, cramming, learning on the job, um, working sort of hand to mouth, and uh, how we live with ourselves as we do that and how we do it are a couple of questions that uh, we'll explore in my group. The, Courier Express went out of business six months after I started working there. So I then uh, had to try and find a job in journalism with six months experience. And as luck would have it, the editor of the Cincinnati Post liked my clips. This is another reality of journalism that, that you'll find out about, which is it does, nobody cares what your credentials are, what degrees you have or don't have, so long as they like what you can produce. Uh, it's sort of like liking the food at a restaurant. You don't really care anything about the age or the sex or the background of the cook. If you like the food, you're willing to go there. And 
So the Cincinnati Post hired me, knowing that their editorial page editor was retiring in two years, and they groomed me for the job. They taught me the city, they taught me the business, sent me to the American Press Institute in Washington to learn about editorial pages. And bit by bit by bit, <laughs> I learned to do it. Uh, it's, it's a very intensive experience. In Cincinnati, the city council is, it consists of nine members elected all at large and uh, for two-year terms. So every single year was either a city council election or a congressional election. In Ohio, they elect all judges. So you had, a, between federal, state, and local offices, you had a huge number of elections to write about every single year, and we interviewed all candidates and all incumbents and challengers. And so uh, it, it was um, sort of like gorging on <laughs> a feast, this, this uh, real crash course in how an American city works and how, how a daily newspaper works. After I'd been doing that for six years, they, that was a Scripps Howard newspaper, and they sent me to Washington to be chief editorial writer for the chain. So my focus shifted from, uh, from local and state affairs. Oh, and also at the Post, I wrote a weekly column uh, where I had scope to write about anything. And uh, in 89, I moved to Washington to write on international and national affairs for the whole chain. And that was one month after Tiananmen Square and just before the, um, the Berlin Wall came down. And so I got to write about all those great world events, again, producing for publication every single day. And it was after I'd been doing that for six years that the Weekly Standard came along. Um, I, um, I read about the, the founding of this magazine in the paper. Um, and was very excited about it because of the wonderful lineup of editors and writers that were involved. Um, I greatly admired Bill Crystal, the editor, and Fred Barnes, the executive editor, and people like Charles Krauthammer and Andy Ferguson. And so when they called me and asked me to be part of the original team as an editor, I was thrilled and leapt at the chance. And. Uh, and had really, at the time, no idea what a great experience it would be and how wonderful it would be. And so I guess the moral of the story is that uh, a, a completely unplanned career, uh, followed just by putting one foot in front of the other, can actually get you to a place you're very, very content to be. Um, I, my group is going to be on opinion journalism uh, as opposed to mainstream journalism, principally reporting. And one of, the, um, one of the threads that I'm sure will, uh, will follow through all of our conversations is the boundaries between those two. And a couple of our, our guests are particularly well-placed to illuminate the, the differences and the overlap between mainstream journalism and opinion journalism. One is Fred Barnes, who um, began life as a reporter in daily journalism covering politics and the Pentagon and Washington. Um, and in mid-career, shifted to uh, uh, the New Republic. And one consequence of that shift was that once you've taken sides as an opinion journalist, you become very valuable to TV, because you can speak up, you can, you can argue on TV. And so he, um, he began a sort of parallel career as a TV commentator. You've probably seen him on the McLaughlin Group or uh, in the last few years uh, on his own show, The Beltway Boys on Fox. Uh, the other, another guest we're going to have who has worked in both opinion and mainstream journalism is Michael Kelly, who was editor of The New Republic for about a year and is currently editor of The National Journal, which is a, an absolutely nonpartisan publication. But if you read the the paper yesterday, it was just announced that the, the owner of the National Journal has bought the Atlantic Monthly, and Michael is going to be the editor of the, of the Atlantic Monthly. So he, um, and also even while he's been uh, editing the National Journal, he's continued his own career in opinion journalism by writing a, 
a column for the Washington Post, which is nationally syndicated. So he's, he's done quite a bit of both. He's also worked for the New Yorker and, and uh, the New York Times. And uh, will be very illuminating, I think, on the, the differences between the two and uh, how you go about um, directing a, each type of publication. And I, I, for one, am very curious to hear what he wants to do with the Atlantic Monthly. I hope he'll tell us. Another thread that will follow through a lot of our conversations is um, what effect does opinion journalism have? I mean, does it ever accomplish anything? Do you ever know whether it accomplishes anything? And one of our guests is somebody who's had the exciting experience of writing work, uh, pieces for her newspaper that had a very clear uh, effect, and that's Maura Casey, who was editorial page editor of the Lawrence Eagle Tribune at a time when that paper uh, did some very important work that resulted in the changing of, of some laws in Massachusetts. And it, it also should be, I hope, interesting to you because uh, the same episode has sort of entered political history. Um, you've probably all heard of the Willie Horton ad, which um, is thought of as a kind of emblematic of the use of race baiting in, in politics. And the story Mora has to tell will give you uh, background to that episode and a different, probably a different uh, light on it. We're going to have a cartoonist. We're going to have a local editorial page editor. We'll have uh, my colleague at the Weekly Standard, Andy Ferguson, who is a brilliant essayist and covered the impeachment hearings for the Standard and um, has covered many conventions and campaigns and has actually been a White House speechwriter like uh, Michael. So one way and another, we're going to cover a wide range of opinion journalism. And I, um, I hope we can air your questions and concerns about it and maybe um, persuade you also that it's, uh, that it's not only fun as a career, but hard and worthwhile and uh, really a challenge worthy of the best talents. And I hope with some recruits in this room. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. And I wish we would have had Al Simpson here tonight because he provides so much color and flavor and so much fun, but Al couldn't be here tonight, so I'm filling in for him. But I think tonight you've seen personal perspectives and how this upcoming fellows program is going to be a very unique experience, not only for the fellows, but also for you. And uh, to give you an idea of the camaraderie that takes place, tomorrow I'm meeting all the fellows that we had this past semester in Montana. We're having a re retreat, reunion, and getting back together. And one thing I think you'll learn is that even though you'll have, in this political process, folks from the left and folks from the right, liberal conservatives, that they learn to respect one another and respect the differences of opinions and learn how in America, in this great democracy, how we can respect one another. We can get on the political forum and fight, but we can come back out here and smile and laugh and call ourselves friends. And these friendships will be forever. And I want you to learn that more than anything is that, yes, fight for what you believe, but learn human decency and respect for one another. And that's what we need more in America. And this leadership of these fellowships will showcase how you can have values and vision, and then you can practically apply it and do it in such a respectful way. Uh, that ends the program tonight. Please take the time to ask any questions you have afterwards and enjoy this fellowship program. Thank you very much. How do we do this?